Hey, Facebook friends, I'm meteorologist Angela Buckman uh, coming to you live from my home for a virtual weather academy. Uh, but don't worry if you don't have children, you're obviously more than welcome to join as well. We're going to talk um, a little bit about some of the instruments that we use to to gather weather information. We also have some really cool live Doppler 13 radar uh, demonstrations to show you and a fun little craft that doesn't require anything but a piece of paper and uh, some crayons, so we'll make it easy on you. And I did wear my fun weather sweater today. You can see my lightning bolt sweater. Um, so we are ready to go. We're gonna run through this presentation and um, shoot me with all your questions. I'm gonna make sure to save lots of time at the end for all your questions as well. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're gonna start with an easy one. Oh, before we go back on uh, to the slides, I've got Grace with me. She's <laughs> doing e-learning. She's 16, almost 17. I'm gonna to try to stump her. Say hi, Grace. Hi. <laughs> I'm gonna to try to stump her on a couple of the instruments that we have because they're not all easy. I'll give you a, a hint that one is an anemometer, which is my favorite, and we'll see if you can guess which one that is. So we're gonna get started. We'll get those slides going, and we're gonna start with what uh, we call a show and tell, Grace. So I'm going to show you, and then you have to tell me <laughs> what it is. So we're gonna start with this first instrument. What is this, Grace? Um. <laughs> You make me look stupid. <laughs> no. we, we use it to measure. I'll give you a hint. You know what this one is. I know. Okay, go ahead. I'm out of camera shy. Oh, no, you're not. You're not on the camera now. That's it. That's, you're not on camera. Just go. You're not. I promise. Go ahead and tell me what this is. <laughs> it's a thermometer. It's a thermometer. You're right. And if you guessed at home like Grace did, it's a thermometer. And what thermometers do, uh, it's an instrument for measuring temperature. Um, and there's obviously the very fancy definition that it contains mercury or alcohol and it expands or contracts with heating or cooling. So there's the fancy definition. <laughs> but we always uh, remind kids at school that it's the same thing that your mom or grandma, aunt, uncle, school nurse, uh, we miss them and uh, thank them for all their hard work. Um, but it's what they use to take your temperature as well. Okay. Well, if you struggled with thermometer, you're going to be really confused on this next one. And this one actually moves. Ooh, look. Wow. What do you think that measures? Wind. Whoa! Good job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it does measure wind. And if you guessed wind, you are correct as well. Now, the fancy name for this is my favorite, anemometer. And it measures wind speed. Uh, the cups actually catch the wind and turn and then kind of gives us an estimation on how much wind. And it's been very windy, right? Yesterday was very windy. Yes, it was very windy. <laughs> okay. The next one, some of you might actually have in your backyard. What is this? Can you see? It measures what falls from the sky. Oh. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little tube that catches rain, and we call it a rain gauge. I don't know. A rain gauge. Uh, so rain gauge just measures the amount of rain that has fallen in a specific time period. And we always recommend if you want to do it like the National Weather Service does or a true storm spotter, you want to make sure it's kind of in the middle of an open area, not near your home, not near a tree. So you can actually get um, a, a really good guesstimate on how much rain has fallen. Um, we also use rulers to measure snow. Mm -hmm. So that, that's an easy one that you might have at home. Okay, this one's really hard, I think. Um, but this one actually measures changes in pressure. And what it is, is a barometer. And we can tell a lot about the weather by the barometer. Because if the barometer is going up, Grace, it means better weather's coming. If the barometer is going down, it means somewhat stormy weather is coming. Um, so that's our show and tell. Got it. Thank you. We'll let you get back to e-learning, and we'll bring you back at the end for our little show, our little craft. Okay. Okay. All right. So she's got stuff to do, So, but we're going to move on, and we're going to move on to spring storms. Um, keep your questions coming because we'll make sure we answer those, and I'll probably wait until the end to answer all of those for you, but I do have our stream up, so we'll make sure we uh, get as many um, questions answered as we can. Okay, so spring storms. Obviously, we're in spring season. We had a couple of storms um, last week. Uh, in fact, uh, a storm that produced an EF1 tornado uh, in Morgan County near Mooresville. So spring storms can bring severe weather. So now that we're kind of all stuck at home, 
really is a good idea to talk about our plan, what we do in the event of severe weather and maybe have a severe weather preparedness kit. So we'll talk all about that, but we're going to start with tornadoes because we do get them in central Indiana. And what's interesting, when, what I found when we talk about tornadoes is we can get them in every month of the year in this state. In fact, every month of the year, we've had a tornado reported in this state. So there are myths surrounding tornadoes and one, tornadoes don't occur in the winter. Well, that's wrong because they can occur any time of the year if the conditions are right. And again, in, in our state, we average somewhere between 20 and 30 tornadoes in a year, um, and we do get them in the wintertime on occasion. Uh, one other myth uh, that surrounds tornadoes is they'll never hit the same place twice. Also not right, uh, Xenia, Ohio, which is just across the state line from us, hit by tornadoes in 1974 and in 2018. One other myth that we have is that tornadoes never hit big cities. That's also incorrect. We've had tornadoes hit Miami, Salt Lake City, uh, the, near the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and other cities have seen tornadoes. In fact, it wasn't that long ago uh, that we had a tornado hit Nashville, Tennessee, which isn't very far from us, and it did hit a big city and unfortunately did do a lot of damage. What we have now with live Doppler 13 radar and some of our enhanced um, oh, software, let's say, with this, is that we can show you uh, a little more in-depth analysis on severe weather. And we actually were able to go back and analyze some of those Tennessee tornadoes, and we did a little bit of video. So just in case you missed it, we're going to run it for you now. We want to show you what this looked like when those storms rolled through. And we're going to back up radar to 1.30 this morning, Nashville time. Obviously, they were dealing with storms, mm -hmm. but some of our enhanced uh, abilities with the radar to pinpoint where the rotation is. And we can do that with this little circle. That shear marker shows the rotation. Also being detected just to the southwest of that shear marker. One other thing with this intense storm is what you see uh, just southwest of that circle is what we call a debris ball. What is a debris ball? A debris ball is basically that debris being blown up in the air thanks to this tornado. Okay. And so the, the debris ball was visible on radar. What other thing we noticed, Scott, is as we take this radar 3D or three-dimensional, you can see the debris being blown off to the east with this storm. And this is a huge area that you're talking about. It is a huge area. It wasn't just uh, developing west of Nashville and then obviously traveled north side and hit the east side of Nashville. But check out all of these communities uh, near and around Nashville from about 1.30 in the morning to 3 a.m. This again is that rotation tracker showing all of the rotation with this tornado and unfortunately uh, a, a lot of damage as we've, as we've seen the pictures. And all of this happening in the middle of the night as people are sleeping. And we know from being in Indiana that is the worst time to have a tornado happen mm. because it leads to the fatalities. But do know we, when and if we have situations like this, we have this ability to show you mm. to help keep you safe. This too. really helps I think our viewers understand what is happening certainly in Tennessee and what possibly could happen here in Indiana. And we've got you covered. All right, Angela, thanks. And we want to make sure that you know when severe weather is coming your way. So we've got lots of ways to keep you informed. And knowing the difference between a watch and a warning is really, really important. Uh, even a couple of days ahead of a severe weather event, we can let you know, okay, the conditions look like they're going to be favorable for severe weather. So we might say there's risk for severe storms in a couple of days. But once we get to that day that there is going to be severe weather, Oftentimes we'll get a watch first, at least hopefully we do. And that comes from the Storm Prediction Center out of Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, a watch means just that. We're going to watch. It means the conditions are favorable for severe weather, whether they be tornadoes or severe thunderstorms. But if it is a tornado watch, actually even if it's a, a severe thunderstorm watch, we need to be prepared for the worst weather that may come with that severe weather event. So that's when we say, OK, we're going to we're going to watch the weather a little closer today maybe download the live Doppler 13 weather app if we haven't already or stay closer to a television or our weather radio so that we're going to be ready when the warnings are issued. When that warning is issued, that's the time to put your action plan into action. You get into the safe place of your home, whether it be a basement or a bathroom or a closet, something in the middle on the lowest level 
with no windows and no doors. So a basement is a great safe spot, but we always tell kids at school, if you don't have a basement, don't worry, just get into the middle of your house. A closet works, a bathroom works, just want to be in the center. We always tell people you wanna put as many walls between you and the outside as you possibly can. Um, now for us, the most important tool we have when we're tracking severe weather is live Doppler 13 radar. And we've got these really cool uh, programs that are associated with radar. One is showing velocity, kind of a complicated word, but we kind of make it easy for you. All you do is look for the red and green close together. And this is video, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be quiet here in a second, um, from Sean Ash analyzing a tornado that was happening south of Crawfordsville, and we were able to see it with live Doppler 13 radar. Montgomery County, uh, you can see, in fact, I wouldn't be shocked if this thing might be on the ground right now, just south of Crawfordsville, west of Mace and Whitesville. Uh, now, east of 231 is where we're getting uh, the signature there. They see the red is the outbound wind and the green next to each other. That's the inbound. So that would be where we have the tightest circulation. That's going to be right in this area right here is where the storm's rotating. This is moving. tracking storms that did produce tornadoes. And for us, we're able to see kind of the beginnings of that with live Doppler 13 radar, but we really need spotters and information from the public, the National Weather Service, all of that information gets relayed to us and the National Weather Service. So what we see on radar is actually confirmed and this is what we saw that day. Now there's no sound with this video, but you can see clearly uh, a tornado and luckily this one was spotted uh, I believe by Chuck Lofton who was out in the field that day uh, and luckily in an open space and if we're going to have tornadoes it's my opinion they always happen in an open space so they don't do any damage but this is one that we caught from uh, from that day and with uh, Chuck actually spotting those um, tornadoes. Um, now what's great is I just had Owen he is seven Hi, Owen. Thanks for watching. He just asked on our Facebook stream, how do tornadoes start? Well, this next video is going to show kind of a graphical explanation of how tornadoes start. And if you're like me, Owen, I don't really like bad weather like this. Um, and it can be kind of scary. But what you have to know is that most storms for us don't produce tornadoes and all of the conditions have to be just right in the atmosphere for us to get a tornado. And a lot of that starts with wind and wind direction and instability in the atmosphere. So we're going to kind of play through this video and I'll kind of talk you through it on how tornadoes are formed. And thank you so much, Owen, for, for watching with us. So we have to have a change in wind direction. Wind has to be coming from one direction at the surface from another wind direction just above the surface and oftentimes even another wind direction higher than that. So it kind of already sets up that spin in the atmosphere with the wind setup. So wind setup is key to how tornadoes are formed. We also actually have to have a, a thunderstorm in the area in addition to this wind setup. But wind is that wind again helps provide that changing wind direction, helps provide that uh, necessary rotation for a tornado to form. And it's that change in direction and change in height as you go up in the atmosphere that helps to support the rotation. So you can see even from these first couple of slides how complicated it actually is to get a tornado to form. Once we have that rotation, the storm the strong thunderstorm has to also be in play for that rotation to then go vertically. And you can see that happening here with this uh, demonstration of the thunderstorm that then once it has enough rotation and spin in the atmosphere, it's strong enough that storm to get that spin that oftentimes is horizontal to begin with to go vertical and actually produce a tornado. By the way, a tornado that isn't reaching the ground isn't really a tornado, it's a funnel cloud. So oftentimes you'll see that funnel cloud first before you actually see that spin that comes vertical with the strong storm to actually produce a tornado. And we can have a funnel cloud and no tornado as well. It just means the atmospheric conditions aren't quite right 
for us to get that that vertical um, eventually that vertical to get the spin down to the surface. So that's how tornadoes are formed. And thank you, Owen, so much for watching. And thank you for the question. We really appreciate it. Uh, let's see. So no, Michael Noah wants to know if the tornado warning is coming to Newcastle, would it be really bad? Yes, we talked briefly about watches and warnings. And if you're just joining us now, feel free to go back to the very beginning if you, if you miss something because kind of interesting that we kind of we talk about the instruments we talk about severe weather we talk about watches and warnings we're now kind of into tornadoes and live doppler 13 radar but feel free to go back and watch in case we miss something but we want to make sure that yes if a warning is issued by the national weather service it is really bad and we want you to make sure that you get into the safest part of your home even if it's a severe thunderstorm warning that means winds are possible over 58 miles per hour uh, hail the size of a quarter or bigger. Um, so yes, a warning means it's bad and we want to make sure that you stay safe. Um, so, okay, so we cover tornadoes. We're going to go into live Doppler 13 radar. Mentioned that we've got some new enhancements and we're going to kind of talk you through what those enhancements mean and kind of show you uh, what, what they are just in case we well, we do get severe weather here. So the next time we have severe weather, you won't be surprised if you see certain things like that. Oh, and I'd let you know, we're about halfway through the presentation. So if you want to get your questions coming, uh, we're ready for them whenever you are. So this is 3D radar. So it's our radar, but we can take it three dimensional to actually show you kind of the, the vertical uh, impact of this storm. How high in the sky is this storm growing? And that's important for analysis reasons. And honestly, it looks kind of cool, too. So you may see us do this as if as we're analyzing storms during uh, severe weather. And it's just a three dimensional view of showing you the radar. We also have something called shear rate. Um, shear rate is basically shows us where there's rotation in the atmosphere. So yes, we can show it with the velocities, which we, we talked about a little earlier, but with this, it's even, almost even easier to show where, the, where there's shear or kind of spin in the atmosphere. And it's also something that we can go back in time. So I don't know if you noticed it as we played this, it actually moved. So it can show us the path of this shear as well, which is important to know, okay, where is this storm going and where can we forecast it to go next? Shear marker is the next one. And we were tracking storms a couple of weeks ago coming out of Illinois, and we actually were able to, to show, uh, we'll get back to the PowerPoint in just a second. Um, if we were actually able to show the shear marker, and basically it's this little yellow rotating cylinder that kind of gives us an idea of where the, the rotation is and where the tornado might be occurring. While they get that back set up, I did have another question. Okay, hi, Hannah. Hannah is 10. Uh, thanks so much for watching. How do you know a tornado is coming? Hannah, that's a great question. Um, sometimes we don't know. We have to be prepared for any thunderstorm to produce tornadoes if the atmosphere is is actually right to produce tornadoes. And so it's our job to make sure that you know, even a couple of days ahead of time, that we're looking at a certain day that there could be severe weather. Uh, on that day, we'll have people in the office, we'll have uh, communication with the National Weather Service, and we'll be watching radar too. So we'll watch any storm that develops and analyze that storm. If that storm shows rotation, even if it's just on the radar, we may have the National Weather Service issue a tornado warning on that, and then you'd want to be watching Channel 13. So we'd get on the air and we'd say, okay, Hannah, this storm is coming your way. It looks like it has rotation. We don't want you to wait for this one to produce a tornado. We know it has rotation, so go ahead in the safe spot of your home. It may not end up producing a tornado, and that's actually good news, but if it would, we'd want to make sure that you're in the safest part of your home, away from windows and doors and on the lowest level. So that's a great question, Hannah. Um, so you have us to let you know when there's bad weather coming. Let's see. Um, May Guilford, age six, has a question. I'll get to you in just a second. This is the shear marker that I was talking about. And this was a storm that we were tracking coming out of Illinois, a uh, little yellow rotating cylinder. So if you're watching at home, it's like, Okay, well, where is this tornado? 
Well, this makes it easy for us to show you where the highest amount of shear or spin or twist in the air is, and this is where that tornado could be. And with the analysis from our from from Barron's, our new uh, our new help with radar, uh, it really oftentimes is very very accurate. And they had a lot of these shear markers down in Nashville when uh, the tornado hit not long ago. And it will be interesting to see, and Barron's already always really good about sharing the information. Uh, we had severe weather, unfortunately, on Easter Sunday that came into yesterday as well um, from the southern part of the country. So it will be interesting to see how uh, Barron, our radar company, did with information like that in those storms and how, and they always look back. Okay, the storms look like this and we know they produce tornado. tornadoes. How did our software look? So we'll be on the lookout for that too, to keep you updated. Uh, let's talk about hook echoes and then I will get to uh, May's question about the weather every day. Hook echoes. This is one way we can detect tornado. Another way we can detect tornadoes too, simply by looking at the radar. And if you look at that little hook in the, in the storm, it really tells us a lot about the storm, where the rotation is, where the tornado might be happening, where we might have debris from the tornado. And we can get this all by looking at the radar image and this hook echo shows where we might have some heavy rain also shows where we have the potential for the largest hail within this storm. Um, let's Let's take a quick break and I'll take a couple, I'll answer a couple of questions and then we'll get to um, how we bring you the weather. And we've got some stuff with uh, conservation and I have three superstars from the WNBA joining us that I'm going to, we'll, we'll get to in just a second. So um, May Guilford, age six, wants to know how, how do we know the weather every day? Well, I went to Purdue. Uh, I studied atmospheric science. Uh, it was really hard. <laughs> Now that I've got a student up at Purdue, I, I'm just proud and surprised I graduated from that really hard university. Um, but we learned, we learned about the weather, how the weather works uh, and why it works. Lots of equations. Now, every day we look at temperatures. At the beginning of the presentation, we talked about all the instruments that we use. Well, those instruments are used every day. Thousands of sites across the country that give us temperature, cloud cover, humidity, wind direction, speed, We've got satellites to show us where there's clouds. We've got radars to show us where it rains. So when I start my work, I always look at the big picture. And I always look from the day before. Was I right from the day before? Um, or did I miss something? Did I, was I off a few degrees or did I miss on a snow total? And if I did, then, then why? So that I better understand how the atmosphere is working currently to be able to predict what's going to happen next. So we always have to know what's going on right now. We also have a handful or so, even more, of computer models that we look at every day that help us take the, the weather right now to what's going to happen next over the next few days. So we do look at computer models, and then I spend some time putting all the graphics together that you see at 5 and 5.30 and 6 and 11. And uh, Sean and I usually work together in the afternoons, and you've got Kelly and Chuck and Lindsay in the mornings. Uh, so we all kind of work together as a team, and especially when there's severe weather or a big winter storm coming, there's lots of communication between the five of us. Um, I'm seeing this. I'm seeing this. What do you think about this? And that really helps to, to work as a group. Okay. Let's talk about how we bring you the weather, and we'll get to more questions in just a second. We bring you the weather, obviously on television, but with new advancements in technology, we can bring it to you like we are today on Facebook Live on the Internet. We've got an app, which is great if you haven't already downloaded the app. Uh, the app is one of my favorites because you can zoom with your own fingers on your home um, on maybe your grandparents' home if they live somewhere different and see the weather that's happening there. You also can sign up for alerts that will alert you to uh, your home, your place of business. So like for me, on a normal day, not today, but on a normal day, I'd be working downtown. So I have alerts set up on my location, but I also have alerts that come to me for my home just in case I want to alert Grace and Luke and Mark and Chewy that something bad is coming to my house. So I really, really love our app. And if you haven't downloaded that, that would be great as well. We also have the Live Doppler 13 mobile storm tracker that is in the garage right now. We're certainly hoping to get it back out and into schools in the fall, provided we're all 
uh, safe and sound by then. But that is our goal, and I'm sure the goal of everybody else is to to make it through this and then uh, to, to get back to somewhat normal. So our live Doppler 13 mobile storm tracker is a great resource too. So we can take it out during severe weather events. Uh, we can take it out on nice weather days as well. So we enjoy uh, having that. And we enjoy having our partners too with uh, Citizens Energy and the Fever. Um, and speaking of Citizens Energy, uh, they wanted us to pass along and really important too, because we talked about severe weather and the spring, but what comes oftentimes in the summer is a drought. We are a state that gets dry conditions like that. So anything that we can do every day to conserve water is is really great. Here are some tips for water conservation. And uh, one of the ones that we didn't put on this is that uh, we always sometimes we talk to kids at school. Do you turn the water off when you brush your teeth? Well, I'm kind of guilty about not turning it off sometimes when I brush my teeth. So that's one way kids at home that you can conserve water too. Um, and getting those reusable water bottles are a great idea too. And you're conserving water and doing your part for the environment as well. If you're uh, using one of those reusable water. So thank you citizens energy group for the tips. And again, we do get droughts here in central Indiana. So it's a good idea to keep that, that stuff in mind. All right, before I get to my famous people, let me see if I have any other questions. Oh, that's a good question, Tammy. Why do some days we get reports of funnel clouds and there aren't tornadoes? It's not a tornado day. We call those cold air funnels. So those happen when the atmosphere still has that kind of spin, enough rotation as you go up in the atmosphere, but really we're not set up for a severe weather day with that clash of air masses. And they happen oftentimes in cold air and we call them cold air funnels. And most of the time, 99% of the time, they don't produce a tornado. They're just strictly called a cold air funnel. Uh, this is a really good question, Tammy. Thank you so much. Um, do storms always move from west to east? Most of the time, yes. Uh, there are a couple of examples of storms that I remember. Uh, Superstorm Sandy being one on the east coast. So that was a big storm on the eastern part of the country. And because with low pressure, we talked about low pressure with the barometer, everything spins counterclockwise. So if we've got a big storm on the east coast and you think about it spinning counterclockwise, those storms are kind of coming back our way. So we do, especially with a storm like that or what's left over from a hurricane, if that spin is east of us, sometimes we'll get our storms to move from east to west instead of west to east but most of the time they do move from west to east. So thank you very much for that question. Uh, let's see here, and that was Carol. Carol, thanks for watching. Um, age seven, Jade wants to know what a debris ball is. I'm glad you asked that. So we talked about that with the hook echo. And we have now the ability with advancements in Doppler radar to show different aspects. So we. We not only show where it's raining and where it's snowing, uh, how the winds might be, how the raindrops are moving to and from the radar as far as velocities go, but we have enhancements with the radar to show things like, um, oh, the debris ball. So I'm not going to give you the exact big word for it, but debris ball. So what it shows is what the radar is picking up is what's flying in the vertical. So for Doppler radar originally, it is used to just show everything in the horizontal. But with the advancement of what's called dual pole radar, we can see what's happening in the vertical. And so sometimes if we get a big tornado and it's throwing debris up into the atmosphere, because now we've got Doppler radar, that dual pole, and it can see in the vertical, it's actually seeing the debris being flown into the air, and that's the debris ball. So we've got some big enhancements with that dual pole radar that show us even um, more information uh, about a storm. So I'm glad you asked about that. Thank you very much. That was Jade, age seven. Let's see here. Oh, thanks, Jill. Boiler up. Yes, I'm a Purdue grad, so thanks for that. Um, I've got a Purdue student back at home, freshman year, which is so crazy. Um, he's got a chem test and a bio test today. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm gonna answer one more and then we'll get to our famous people. Uh, how do you figure out wind chill? Wind chill is, is a chart. So you take the temperature and you take the wind speed and you figure it out. So you can Google if you're 
safely allowed to Google with your family and your friends, um, the wind chill chart. So if the wind is at 30 miles per hour and say the temperature is 20, it will give you an estimation of what the wind chill is. And it's basically just a feels like temperature. And it's important here when we get those wind chills sub-zero because we don't want kids standing at the bus stop when it's that cold. And it's just a good idea to take precautions when it does get that cold. All right, who's ready for famous people? I am. Okay, we've got some fever players with some questions for us. Now here's a real slam dunk. What does the weather have to do with potholes? Oh, what does the weather have to what does the weather have to do with potholes? Thank you, Natalie. Uh, the weather has to do a lot with potholes. So in the winter time, we get rain, we get snow, it warms up, it gets cold, people drive over roads. Well, if we get little cracks in the roads and then we get rain or snow, that moisture can sometimes get trapped in those cracks. And let's say it's warm, so it's still liquid. Uh-oh, but then all of a sudden it starts to freeze and those cracks get bigger and a pothole starts to form. Well, that process happens over and over and over again, especially in Indiana, because we like to drive our cars and we get temperatures that go up and down a lot in the winter time. And it's that up and down in terms of temperature, that freeze thaw that eventually makes the potholes bigger. So we are a state that gets potholes and the weather has a lot to do with that because of the freeze and the thaw. And unfortunately, uh, there's really not much of a solution for that. But we thank uh, all of the crews that help patch those potholes and, and keep us moving. Okay, who is next from the fever? We hit the court, we hit like a fast moving tornado. Do you know what they call a tornado that's over water? I do know what a tornado over water is called, and they do move just like a tornado on the court over there at Bankers Life Fieldhouse. Uh, a tornado over water is called a water spout. Uh, we can get similar motions to a tornado uh, in the form of a dust devil out in the dry areas of the country, but they all kind of have this sim uh, a similar movement or motion to them, but a tornado over water is called a water spout. You know, our colors are fever red, blue, and gold. But have you ever wondered why clouds are white? I do wonder why clouds are white, and sometimes I wonder why they're gray. Uh, Grace and I have talked about that. She plays a lot of golf, and so we, we look at a lot of, well, she plays golf and I look at a lot of clouds. And so sometimes they're really dark at the bottom. Sometimes they're puffy, sometimes they're thin. It just kind of depends on where they are in the atmosphere. Are they made up of ice crystals? Are they made up of water droplets? Is there sun? And what is the angle of the sun? So it's because of the sun's light hitting the water droplets or the ice crystals that causes some of the energy to scatter. And then that light beam changes. So it all has to do with the sunlight, the sun angle, and kind of bouncing off those water droplets and ice crystals. Thank you so much to our favorite WNBA team, The Fever, for being part of the Weather Academy and for those great, great questions and being so great on the court and in our community as well. All right, I'm gonna answer a few questions and then we're gonna talk about our little craft that you can do. And it's a little audience participation um, and we'll give you uh, some a little more information about that in just a second. Okay. Oh, and Kelly, thanks for watching. Um, she's she says she's 52 and never too old to learn. So we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much for your support. We appreciate that. Um, oh, and Amanda just watching today, and she's going to watch every Tuesday. Thank you. We'll try to mix it up a little bit just in case you are watching every Tuesday, so you, you don't get the same thing every time. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and Robert knew the answer to the fever question about the potholes. Uh, let's see here. I think I've answered just about every question. Um, okay, I didn't, I'm going to go back. I didn't answer Channing, age nine. How early do you start tracking storms? We track storms all the time. So I did have a question about how do we know what weather is coming next? Well, we look at the weather every day. Even when I'm not working, I look at the weather every day. And so we kind of know how is the atmosphere changing? 
does it look like the atmosphere is going to have uh, enough instability to produce thunderstorms? Does it look like it's going to have that change in wind direction that we need to have to support tornadoes? So we can know a couple of days ahead of time. Do we get surprised that, oh my gosh, I thought this was going to be a quiet day and this thunderstorm popped out of no nowhere? Yes, that does happen, especially in central Indiana and especially in the summertime when we get those pop-up storms. But just know that we are always watching and we try to give you as much um, notice ahead of time that the storms are coming so that you're prepared and that you're not caught off guard. Oh, Bethany, she got the question right about the rain gauge. I tried to stump Grace at the beginning. We're going to bring Grace back here in a second. Um, let's see. I answered how do tornadoes start. Thank you for watching from Fishers. We appreciate that. Uh, let's see here if I can go back. Oh, is it someone's birthday? I think I must have missed whose birthday it is. Somebody's birthday. If it's your birthday, happy birthday. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Um, when this, when I'm done live, it will start over. So feel free to go back if you, um, if you missed it at the very beginning. Uh, Terry, a teacher watching. Thank you. Um, and thank you for doing all of the e-learning and the remote learning. Uh, I know it can't be easy. Grace is trying to e-learn beside me. I don't think it's going very well today. <laughs> so teachers, we appreciate you. Um, nurses, doctors, first responders, we appreciate you very much right now. Um, oh, Jamil, I hope I said that properly. Jamil, age 14, how are icicles made? So it kind of has to do with the same freeze thaw process that we get with potholes. It's just sometimes it comes in that vertical direction like an icicle. They can happen off of mailboxes. They can happen off of gutters. Uh, so you have to have a little bit of liquid going in that direction before it freezes for it to form an icicle. I know I get some of the most interesting icicles if we get freezing rain, which if I had to pick my least favorite weather, it's freezing rain because it's impossible to drive. It can bring down trees and power lines, and it's just a mess. So icicles form, again, by having a little bit of liquid, but also that freezing that catches that. Um, uh, icicles are kind of pretty, though. I'll, I'll give you that. Okay, Henry. Hi, Henry. Henry's nine. He wants to know why it's called a downpour. Um, that's a good question. I use downpour if we're talking about heavy rain, um, light rain. Light rain is light rain, drizzles, just kind of a mist. But if it's heavy rain, sometimes we'll call it a downpour. Um, good question. And thanks for watching, Henry. Let's see here. Oh, Grant, age eight, asked about one of my favorite processes, and this is hail. How does hail change sizes? Okay, so hail starts as a water droplet. Remember, we answered the uh, fever player question about why clouds are white and that they're full of water droplets or ice crystals. Well, let's say you've got a thunderstorm cloud and it's called a thunderstorm cloud is called a cumulonimbus cloud, which also might be my favorite cloud. Um, so a cumulonimbus cloud grows really high in the sky and it's full of water droplets. Those little dro water droplets, because what's causing that cloud to grow really high are strong winds, those little water droplets get pushed to the top of the cloud where it's cold. So those little water droplets now become little ice pellets. So they get heavy and they might fall back down to the bottom of the cloud where it's warm and they melt and they get bigger. And then they go back up to the cloud and get cold again. And they go up and down, up and down several times before it gets big enough to fall out of the cloud. It can be the size of a pea. It can be the size of a marble. It can be the size of a golf ball. It can be the size of a softball. In fact, the biggest hailstone reported in Indiana is the size of a softball. We don't want hail that big here because that does lots of damage. But I will tell you, if you get a hailstone that is big enough and you can safely cut it in half, has to be safely, has to be done with a parent or an adult, you can actually see rings like a, a tree has rings to tell you how old it is. The rings of that hailstone will tell you how many times it went up and down in the cloud before it got big enough to fall out. Hail is so interesting to me, so I'm so glad you asked that. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, Sherry, if you weren't a nurse, you'd be a meteorologist. Uh, I wish I could say the same. Uh, I don't think I could be a nurse. So God bless you and thank you for what you're doing, especially right now. We really, really appreciate it. Um, oh, that's a good question. 
Uh, Will, age seven, wants to know, so where does the debris go from a tornado? Well, it kind of depends on the wind. Where is where is the wind blowing at that point? And what's interesting for us figuring out if it was a tornado or was it just straight line winds that did the damage, National Weather Service survey teams will go out and they often look at the, d- the debris pattern. Is the debris spread in different places or is it all pushed in one direction? If it's all pushed in one direction, then you know it was straight line winds. If it's kind of scattered about, that's a sign that there was rotation and was a a tornado. So it kind of just depends on how strong the winds are with the tornado. And there are some, if you're really interested, I think that was Will that asked that question. If you're really interested, Will, and uh, you're allowed to with your parents, maybe do a little searching on the internet, there are stories of things from people's homes that have been blown into different cities from tornadoes. So tornadoes can be very, very strong and very destructive. I'll let you know for us in Indiana, we're typically on the lower end of that destructive scale, which is good news. Um, But again, if you're allowed to do some searching, it is interesting that there are stories about where certain things from people's homes ended up after a big tornado. Let's see here. Okay, so uh, where's the best place to move during a tornado? If you have a basement, that's safe. Okay, got it. Last question. Um, And then feel free to continue to ask questions. I'll answer more. I just won't be live, but I'll answer them uh, later today on the Facebook page. Okay, so last question, where to go during a tornado? You want to be in the basement, away from windows and doors. If you don't, a bathroom, something that doesn't have windows, a closet. And the question included, I've heard things about bathtubs and things like that. Well, I have too. I, I don't necessarily know if that's a myth, but I've always heard that if you can be in a bathtub in the lowest level, that there's plumbing. So there's something actually attached to into the ground that perhaps would give you um, a little more shelter, a little more stability in a tornado. It's also a good idea to have a, a kit. What would what would we need in that kit? Something to keep you busy, coloring books, crayons, um, a helmet or pillow, some water, things that you might need if you have to spend uh, an hour or two in your safe place, and that that bicycle helmet or a pillow, something to protect your head just in case there is mine debris. We want to thank you so much for joining us. Our craft is easy. All you need are crayons and a piece of paper, and we want you to draw your favorite weather, your most favorite weather. I'm going to make some room for Grace because she's coming back. Um, and then I'm going to let you know. Put these on this Facebook page, and I will post a few during this week on the news at 5 and 6. Um, So draw your favorite weather. If you post it, you're giving us permission to use it on television. So if you don't want us to use it on television or you don't want us to use your name, don't put it on here. Because if I see your great artwork, I'm going to put it on TV. And so we hope that you did. Okay, my favorite is rain. And this is what I drew. I don't know if you can see it. So I drew a cloud. Grace, help me with the rain because I am not an artist. So I drew a cloud with some rain because I like to hear the sound of the rain. All right, Grace, what did you draw? Okay, I drew um, the sun and some clouds because I love when it's warm and sunny. Okay, so we want to see your favorite weather. If you want to draw a tornado, if you want to draw a snowstorm, um, draw whatever. And with your parents' permission... Put it on the Facebook page, and then we will. Um, if I get a few, we'll show a few for the rest of the week at five and six. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe in these uncertain times, and and know that we're with you, and we're in this together, as they say. And we'll see you later.